civil rights activist Rosa Parks taught, each person must live their life as a model for others. Source of life, whom we call by many names and understandings. We gather to honor the accomplishments of our graduating students at Pomona College. We are humbled that this moment marks not only the significant honing of their intellectual abilities, but also the awareness of our graduates' capacity to live their lives as a model for others, to make ordinary and extraordinary choices of conscience and consequence that will not only impact their own lives, but those around them. On this beautiful morning of celebration, we are filled with hope that our graduates will choose the model of courage and integrity, justice and equality. We acknowledge with gratitude the people who supported our students on their path, the family and friends who provided the foundations of love and endurance, and the students faculty, staff, administrators, and trustees who inspired, mentored, and guided them through challenges and uncertainties. In times of sweetness, we are also keenly aware of the sorrow for those we are missing, but who are always present in our hearts and minds. As we reflect on all that brings us to this pivotal time, we pause focus on this precious moment and offer these words of hope and prayer. Holy One, may these graduates be constantly inspired to exercise strength of character in a world that is desperate for their ethical leadership and strive for equality among all humanity. May they have the courage to be different and to be true to their deepest spiritual values. May these graduates responsibly care for the earth and all of creation, and may the wisdom and the compassion they have learned here guide them to live a life that models for others the creation of a more just and peaceful world. Amen. Good morning. On behalf of the trustees, faculty, and staff of Pomona College, and especially the members of the senior class who will receive their degrees today, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 122nd Commencement Exercises of Pomona College. On this occasion, I would like to extend particular thanks and appreciation to the family and friends of the class of 2015. You have provided the support and encouragement for the graduating seniors, bringing them to this turning point in their lives. Graduation from college represents a great moment of change. It is the culmination of many years of schooling, initially broad and focused and generalized, becoming more focused with time. In your four years at Pomona College, I hope and trust that you have discovered and valued the goals of a liberal education. First, to think critically and creatively, Second, to communicate effectively in speech and writing. And third, to carry with you a lifelong joy and passion for learning. Commencement is a fresh start, a beginning of a new life outside these college walls, in which the abilities and skills that you have gained here are the added riches that you bear in trust for humankind. Each member of the graduating class of 2015 has fully met the high standards of Pomona College. Each has contributed in varied and wonderful ways to our community, in the classroom, through research projects, to campus life, and through service to those around us. At yesterday's Class Day Awards Ceremony, we learned some of the ways in which members of this class have distinguished themselves. At commencement, which is above all a celebration of the academic accomplishments of our graduates, it has been traditional to take special notice of one of these awards, the Rena Gurley Archibald Prize which is given to the member of the graduating class with the highest academic achievement. This year, the Rena Gurley Archibald High Scholarship Prize is awarded to Megan Walner. <laughs> the
The educational mission of this college relies critically on close collaboration between students and teachers. Pomona College faculty members are dedicated to excellent teaching in all its settings, leading discussions in classrooms, supervising research projects in library or laboratory, coaching teams on athletic fields, preparing students for concert or theater performances, guiding artists in studios. And so every year at this time, as it awards degrees to its graduates, the college also honors those of its faculty who exemplify teaching at its best, the winners of the college's Wig Award for Excellence in Teaching. This award is granted each year by a committee of trustees and faculty on the basis of ballots cast by students. It is the highest honor the college awards to its faculty. Let me ask this year's winners of the Wig Award for Excellence in Teaching to stand as I read their names. Assistant Professor of Linguistics and Cognitive Science, Michael Dirks. <laughs> Associate Professor of Art History, Phyllis Jackson. The John Knox McLean Professor of Religious Studies, Zane Kassam. <laughs> the Edwin F. and Martha Hahn Professor of History and Africana Studies, Sidney Lamel. Assistant Professor of Chemistry, Jane Liu. <laughs> professor of Japanese, Lin Meake. <laughs> In absentia, Professor of Sociology and Chicano Latino Studies, Gilda Ochoa. <laughs> and finally, Assistant Professor of Biology, Sarah Olson. One lesson that I hope every graduating student will take from this college is that the accomplishments of people working together are greater than those of single individuals, however distinguished. Pomona College strives to foster collaborative work between students and with faculty, and the chief goal of its staff is to enhance educational experiences that take place on campus. On this occasion, we are also connected to past and future. The college that we see today and that will educate future generations is here because of the hard work, distinguished accomplishments, and generous support of past members of our community, the literally thousands of people who have taught, worked, and studied here, and the donors who have sustained them. We are particularly honored to have with us, along with faculty, students, staff, family, and friends, 13 members of the college's board of trustees, led by our board chair and your class day speaker, Jean Buckley of the class of 1965. <laughs> Today, we welcome a new class into this great fellowship. And so, in each other's company and then in the great tradition of all those who have taught, studied, worked, and played at this college over the years, let us now proceed to celebrate the class of 2015 and launch them on their way. Good morning, faculty and staff, friends and family, fellow classmates. I am honored to have served this class in our senior year and excited to be sharing some words with you today. Before I begin, I would like to say that the teal ribbons and badges many of my classmates and some faculty are wearing are in honor of the survivors of sexual assault on our campus, 
and a reminder that Pomona must not only be a safe place for survivors, but also a forerunner in the fight against rape culture. In trying to come up with a kind of speech that would be relevant to about 400 people, I thought through the list of things I could possibly talk about. Failure, success, the fear of the unknown, apartment hunting, rent, making your own meals, etc. After countless hours agonizing over what exactly I wanted to say, I recalled a pretty insightful Facebook status from Pomona First Year Tom V, which said, Wondering if there's a time to be okay, but not be okay, whilst living the lovely but relentless Pomona life. With that in mind, I'm going to attempt to talk about two things today. Institutions and loneliness. Things that we're all somewhat familiar with at this point, I bet. In the summer of 2012, right after a sophomore slump had ended, I became friends with a nameless nostalgic senior who remarked upon seeing the emptiness of a college that had been bustling the week before, wow, institutions are buildings, but institutions are people too. It was the kind of thing that was supposed to be profound in the way that remarks at 2 a.m. by sleep-deprived college kids are supposed to be profound. So I nodded politely and promptly forgot about it until I was struggling to find something to say in this speech. Yes, institutions are people all the way from Margaret Adorno's emails about class registration to the students whizzing down on sidewalks with their skateboards threatening our lives. <laughs> on a more serious note, what this means is that we are the builders of the very things we engage in. Some of us being responsible for bigger portions than others, but each one of us builders nonetheless. The implications of this are endless. In such an undeniable network of relationships and of lives, every single action we take matters. It means that one traumatic experience can spiral into an unbearable semester, into difficult years, and that a sustained silence from the community and the invisibility that results will hurt many others. But it also means that true communal care will lift your head up when you're weak, and that a shout out from Dr. Maria Tucker or Dean Towns in the middle of a bad week can remind you that you matter. Pomona professor and renowned poet Claudia Ranking said of loneliness, that it's what we can't do for each other. Today I ask, when can we fill in the gaps for others? When can we be buffers against violence? When do we refuse to be complicit in enforcing alienation? As we move towards an incessant bout of self-reflection, away from our friends and back to our old bedrooms and neighborhoods, or maybe to unknown places, it is important to think about the new spaces we wish to create. Thrown into a community of people with different ideals, politics, and opinions, how do we proceed? If my Pomona education has taught me anything, it has taught me to ask these questions of myself. When can I be better? How can I listen longer? When can I empathize? And I throw them back to this community gathered here today. When can we be better? How can we listen longer? When can we empathize? What are the limits to our compassion for one another? And I do not mean this in the banal we need world peace kumbaya way that reduces active painful engagement to buzzwords like multiculturalism and diversity, but to really insist that we ask ourselves, what are the limits to our compassion? If our actions and policies have the power to create spaces that can hold, support, or turn away, what are our roles as people with agency, as people with power, graduating from an elite institution? What are our blind spots, and what do we need to learn more about? What is the purpose of an education such as this one if we refuse to grow to feel for others? My time here has been tender. I have been supported and loved beyond measure, and I have laughed so deeply and been held in hugs that have simultaneously nourished and taken the breath out of me. I have also felt really lost, and I have been scared. I've had to hide accents and to swallow words to not appear too angry or too ungrateful. Perhaps this is something that resonates with each one of us. How to reconcile the difficulties with the joy. Pomona has taught me that love goes a long, long way. 
that while the road to building rigorous supportive communities can be fraught with bureaucracy and politics, there's incredible joy and a surprising abundance of hope in walking the talk all 47 miles through over and over again. It is my hope that if and when we ever call ourselves reverent, eager, and thoughtful, class of 2015, that we do so with an honesty that is true to ourselves and to others, and that we do so with an energy that is similarly as lovely and relentless as this Pomona life. There are no bridges formed in loneliness, and shaky structures do not stand. Thank you so much. So I thought I was like already and the nerves were gone and then Debbie just did that and now I'm like, oh man, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, good morning everyone, um, faculty, staff, students, families. Um, it's great to see you all in the audience and to have everyone here today. I'd like to start with an introduction of my own. Um, I've been called many names uh, by many different people. Um, some call me Cam. Uh, to a dear friend, I'm known as CC. Uh, given my affinity this year for red flannel and an ever-lengthening beard, as you can see, I've coined myself Lumber Black. Um, <laughs> but I suppose my truest name, so to speak, is Cameron Joseph Cook. But what's in a name? I'm told by my parents that Cameron was a name they just liked, and that makes sense. Nothing wrong with that. I like it too. <laughs> Cook, my last name, denotes the sort of Ellis Island journey of German immigrants that became my father's lineage. And my middle name, Joseph, is from my mother's father and my grandfather, whom I never knew. But in my name, he lives on, and I live on in his. I wanted to introduce myself this way to reference a speech my dear friend Rachel Jackson gave at the beginning of this year, where she urged us to talk about the importance of names and treating names with care. And it seems most fitting today, a day when all of our names are to be read out loud as we walk across the stage to remember that. Because names really themselves are just short stories. Stories of family and love, stories of immigration and diaspora, of pain, of histories, and of futures to come. I urge us all, as this long ceremony continues, to pay attention to these stories of how we came to be here, who we came here with, as we continue on into wherever we're going. So that was my introduction. Uh, <laughs> In, pairing, in preparing this speech today, uh, what I wanted to do was share some stories, and I thought and I reflected and I wrote some down, um, but it's so hard to think of stories that can best summarize my and our time here at Pomona. There are just far too many, and some that I'm sure I don't quite remember. Uh, and while I'm incredibly grateful to have been chosen to speak by my wonderful classmates, uh, I can't possibly speak for all of the amazing people sitting before me today. There's no way that I could do all of you justice. Um, your stories are yours to tell and yours alone. Our job will be to listen. Listening, after all, is something that I'm much more used to. Listening to teachers, listening to friends, listening to the noises and voices that make up the music of our lives. So since I can't speak for all or maybe even any of you today, I thought instead I might do something a little different and speak to someone. Uh, and thinking about today as a culmination of years, decades even, of learning, I found myself wanting to speak one last time with all of my teachers, visiting the offices of my favorite professors, having conversations with my closest of friends. But over and over again, there was one person who I kept coming back to who has been speaking to me in some form or another for over 10 years at this point, someone who may have dropped out of college because they were always late for registration, but they did eventually graduate. Uh, and you know, they've gotten through, I have gotten me through all of my 808s and heartbreak and this beautiful, dark, twisted fantasy that is Pomona College. <laughs> so for the rest of this speech, class of 2015, I present to you an open letter to Kanye West or the unexpected virtue of ignorance. <laughs> <clears throat> Dear Mr. West, <laughs> can I call you Kanye? We've never met, but you've been in my life for years. You were my middle school soundtrack, the music I turned to when my vision was first obstructed by the color line of racism. 
Your music was what I drowned myself in during the lowest moments of my depression my sophomore year at Pomona College. Your lyrics were the ones that scratched my throat as my best friend and I drunkenly yelled them late at night, unsure if we were laughing or crying. As I've been approaching graduation, I've been returning to your music ever more frequently, more so than usual. You see, in your first album, you dedicate multiple skits to decrying the uselessness of degrees. That accumulated degrees won't keep you warm when you're dead. His words, not mine. <laughs> and as I stand here today, ready to complete one degree and begin another, I can't help but wonder if in some ways you're right. Because I'm so conflicted. Um, today is an incredibly happy day. We made it. We did. We made a way out of no way. But you see, my senior year at Pomona College, it started with Ferguson and it's ending with Baltimore. Fellow students in Mexico and Kenya have died pursuing their education. And as I've worked and I've sweat here, I felt so, so guilty. I've kept returning to your words in your song, Power, when you say this. You say, I just needed time alone with my own thoughts, got treasures in my mind but couldn't open up my own vault. My childlike creativity, purity, and honesty is honestly being crowded by these grown thoughts. Reality is catching up with me, taking my inner child. I'm fighting for custody with these responsibilities that they entrusted me as I look down at my diamond-encrusted piece, thinking no one man should have all that power. I don't have a diamond-encrusted piece, by the way. I wish. So you can see, I've been so conflicted and confused. They say that we live in a bubble, a campus removed from the real world. And now as we're graduating, it feels that that bubble is about to burst upon contact with reality. But what scares me, I think, more than this bubble is the fact that this bubble does not really exist. To be clear, being at Pomona and college in general has granted us immense privilege and power, some of which feels undeserved at times. But Pomona is the real world. It's a part of the real world that's supported by labor of all kinds, some made more visible than others. Our gorgeous campus has labor behind it. Our clean residence halls have labor behind it. Everything that happens on this campus, good and bad, is inextricably tied to the world beyond these gates and vice versa. But don't get me wrong, I know this has been pretty bleak, but I'm conflicted because Pomona College has also changed my life. Pomona is where I met the most amazing people. Seriously, that's not just like a platitude on graduation. It, there are amazing people here. The faculty, but also the students. Students who are friends, teachers, warriors, activists, fighters, reformers, jokesters, and more. To echo Colson's wonderful speech yesterday, Pomona is where I learned to practice community. Pomona is where I learned to love myself. And so maybe it's okay to feel a little guilty. It's a reminder of the charge that I've been given. And this time is, after all, one of celebration, to celebrate ourselves, our accomplishments, our communities and families. We did it. And maybe, Kanye, you're right about the degrees. Maybe they are meaningless. Or maybe their meaning is only what we make of it. Maybe what's more important is the stories that these degrees represent the triumphs and struggles, the loves and the futures. Maybe, no wait, definitely, Toni Morrison got it right in her Nobel Prize lecture because Toni Morrison knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> in it, Morrison recounts the story of an old blind woman, an oracle of sorts, possessing immense wisdom. So when young people come to her, hoping to stump her by saying, there's a bird in our hands, is it alive or dead? Because the woman can't see the bird, the kids think she's unable to answer their question. They think they've got her. And in fact, she does answer with silence. And frustrated at her silence and frustrated with her lack of an answer, they admit that there really was no bird in their hands to begin with. And they grow angry. They grow angry that she can't bequeath to them knowledge about this bird. Knowledge that for them comes to symbolize their questions about identity, mortality, and life. Only then, when they're done speaking, does the woman respond. She says, finally, I trust you now. I trust you with the bird that is not in your hands because you have truly caught it. Look, how lovely it is, this thing we have done together. You see, in the children's furious desire for knowledge, they come to know themselves without necessarily realizing it. 
And perhaps that best approximates what we've done here at Pomona College. That in our quest for knowledge, our greatest discoveries have been ourselves. So no, Kanye, I don't think I know what to do with this degree now that's in my hands, or maybe it's not. I'm not sure I ever will. But to borrow your words to send off my wonderful class of 2015, until we do know what to do with these degrees, fuck that, the world's ours. Thank you.
brings here, if Lord thou count me. When I was on the job market for a faculty position way, way back in 2002, some liberal arts colleges still expected their computer science faculty to maintain the computer systems. With neither interest nor experience, I resolved that I was only going to take a job offer at a department that already had their own system administrator. So at Pomona, I was told that they had just created such a position and that they were in the process of filling it. Thus reassured, I accepted the job. That fall, I met Mikey Dickerson. He was the new system administrator and also a class of 2001 Pomona math major. He was technically gifted, blessed with a uniquely charming personality, and always willing to tell people all the things that he felt they really needed to know. <laughs> Sadly for us, he left for Google three and a half years later. At Google, he was employed as a site reliability engineer, but he also took leaves of absence to work on both Obama campaigns. You may recall that many political analysts attributed Obama's 2012 re-election victory to his campaign analytics team. After that, he went back to Google, and then in the fall of 2013, he was asked by the White House to join an ad hoc team tasked with fixing the healthcare.gov website after its troubled launch. On the line was the public's access to affordable healthcare. Just six weeks later, the website was running smoothly, and the team had succeeded in preserving the president's vision for healthcare reform. Time Magazine accordingly took note and put Mikey and the rest of the healthcare.gov group on its cover in March 2014. And then, just a few months later, making history again, Mikey returned to Washington, D.C. as the administrator of the newly created U.S. Digital Service, an agency whose mission is, quote, to improve and simplify the digital experience that people and business have with their government, close quote. I suspect that Mikey's technical expertise and charming personality continue to serve him exceedingly well in his current job. I do know for a fact that he still gets to tell people what they really, really need to know, for example, telling software engineers that there are better uses for their talents than writing apps for sharing photos of food. <laughs> Mikey, thank you for serving our country and for being an inspiration. 
Mr. President, on behalf of the Board of Trustees and the faculty of Pomona College, it is my great honor to present to you Mikey Dickerson for the honorary degree of Doctor of Science. Michael Dickerson, by the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Science in Pomona College, honoris causa. Thank you. This is quite an honor. I'm pleased to note I seem to have been sorted into Hufflepuff. <laughs> I knew I was going to have to say a couple of things, and I had uh, no idea what they would be. So I applied the uh, time-honored scientific tradition of asking a couple of people that I knew what they thought. I learned a couple of things. The first one is that grown-ups take these commencement speeches very, very seriously. Uh, there are maybe a couple dozen of my close friends and coworkers that have uh, tuned in to uh, see these couple minutes I'm going to talk here, which is to say that in point of fact, it's quite a bit more than the number of people that came to see me actually graduate in the first place. <laughs> <clears throat> the second thing I learned is that uh, Nobody actually remembers what anybody said at their own graduation uh, whatsoever. Uh, so it's more than probable that those of you that are graduating today that I'm ostensibly talking to are going to have forgotten this by lunch, <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> so these two things seem to stand in contradiction. How do these things make sense? The only thing I come up with is that for grown-ups, uh, Doing a speech like this is the closest thing we get to being able to go back in time and tell ourselves what we would have wanted to hear when we were 21 years old. Uh, the lot of you graduating today are the closest thing that there is in the world to a carbon copy of what I was when I was 21 years old. Uh, and it does make you a little bit emotional, I'd admit. This only makes sense if you think that as grown-ups, or what passes for grown-ups anyway, we're, uh, we think that we know something about how our lives should have been lived. This is a very dubious proposition uh, in the best case, and I can tell you I am not the best case. <laughs> there is nobody more surprised than I am to be standing here doing this right now, <laughs> with the possible exception of a few professors behind me. This I know because some of them have forgotten that I can read their Facebook posts. <laughs> I'm just going to face this way for the next minute or two. <laughs> the reason this is surprising is because uh, listening to uh, Professor Chen's uh, introduction, which she did a great job of, by the way, and a little uh, program printed here, uh, everything I've ever done that was considered noteworthy by anybody was something that was not part of any plan whatsoever. Uh, I did not have a plan to go work at Google. That might have never happened if uh, one of my friends from Pomona had not encouraged me to call back that recruiter that time. I didn't have a plan to go work on the uh, Obama campaign. It was just that they needed a specific technical niche that I happened to be doing at Google, and they asked for help, and I went, to, I went for a little while. Um, I absolutely did not have a plan to get mixed up in healthcare.gov in 2013. Uh, that only happened because a couple of people remembered me from the campaign and thought I might uh, be of some use. I, don't, I especially don't know why the press wrote that story as if I was the hero of healthcare.gov. Uh, I was just part of a group. There was a team of incredibly talented uh, and capable people and very dedicated uh, that, that pulled off that, that mission, made it so that today we can stand here and say 16 and a half million more people have gotten access to health care for the first time. <laughs> I'll clap too, because it mostly wasn't me. <laughs> and the Affordable Care Act is working. That was my assigned talking point, by the way. <clears throat> I got that in there. <laughs> for those following along at home. <laughs> Today I worked for the president on an array of government problems that make healthcare.gov look like a pleasant little diversion from 2013. Uh, 
I have allies in this that include some of the most powerful people in the world uh, that I get to work with. And I have an engineering team that might be the strongest engineering team that exists in the country right now today. And I'm saying this not to brag, but so that you will get my full meaning when I say, you can believe me, none of us has an answer key. It's kind of an exaggeration to say we have a plan a lot of the time. And none of us would be there if we had been following a script. I am sure this story doesn't make a lot of sense to some of you, uh, quite possibly those of you whose names appear at the top of the program there, who have worked very hard and are graduating with honors and going on to grad school and know where you're going next and where you're going after that. Uh, I, I congratulate you on your hard work and achievement. I wish you all success in the world. And I don't have much to say to you because your lives are nothing like mine. <laughs> or at least if they are, you don't know it yet. We'll see you back here in a few years. <laughs> There's some others among you who are maybe a little relieved to see your name in the program today at all. <laughs> maybe you PNC'd a couple of classes down to the wire there. Uh, just got the grades turned in on Friday and we're pleased to hear that you'd be walking today. I especially congratulate you. Well done. <laughs> And it was uh, mostly for that group that I thought it might be helpful for you to hear that uh, from now on, it's really going to matter not a lot how good, you, how good a job you do of making a plan and sticking to it. It's going to matter much more how well you adapt and respond to uh, unexpected new inputs, which might be crisis, which might be opportunity. The parents like this one, yeah. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> See, that's because a lot of the parents were in that second group that I just described. <laughs> the professors, not so much. They were the, they were the valedictorians and so on. <laughs> anyway, there'll be crises, there'll be opportunities. A lot of times it'll be hard to tell which is which. So if your mind should happen to wander a little bit in the uh, program that we've got uh, for the next couple hours here, I would suggest that you take a minute and think about what kind of story you might want to be telling uh, when you're up here in 10 or 15 years receiving your uh, honorary PhD and what that might sound like. And then get, get ready for uh, none of those things to happen the way you expected. So thank you. going to get a little serious now. Andrew Hoyam is dedicated to make sure that the legacy of the past has a place in the future. Born in Sioux Falls, South Dakota in 1935, Andrew came to California and graduated from Pomona College in 1957. He served in the U.S. Navy and then settled in San Francisco, where he began his lifelong dedication to the world of fine book publishing. He founded Arion Press in 1974. Located inside a former steam plant in the Presidio with its own typecast foundry and historic collections, it is among the world's last comprehensive printing facilities for handcrafted books. Himself an accomplished poet and artist, Andrew Hoyam, alongside his master printers, typesetters, and bookbinders, produced by hand some of the most beautifully realized books in the world. With only a precious few created each year, these works combine the greatest of literature and of contemporary art. They include the titles of Moby Dick and Ulysses and writers such as Allen Ginsberg and Samuel Beckett and the art of Kara Walker, Julie Muretu, and John Baldessari, among many others. In these stunning works, text takes form, pressed into beautiful paper. They have a visual and a physical presence. Michael Kimmelman of the New York Times writes, there are too few things in the world that can be said to be done with perfect love and care. Arion makes fresh art out of old and not so old literature by matching artist and writer with typeface, paper, and binding. 
Collected by over 70 libraries and institutions, Ariane Press books are found in the British Museum, the Huntington Library, and the Museum of Modern Art, where they have been exhibited and named among the most important book art publications of the 20th century. The press is a living museum, open to the public, with its own foundation that has been de designated from the National Trust for Historic Preservation. All it has accomplished are a tribute to Andrew Hoyam's artistry, vision, and commitment. Mr. President, on behalf of the Board of Trustees and the faculty of Pomona College, it is my great honor to present to you Andrew Lewis and Hoyam for the honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. Andrew Hoyam, by the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Letters in Pomona College, honoris causa. For the 50th reunion of my Pomona class, of 1957 in 2007, I recited a ditty at our dinner. It recalls the orange groves that surrounded the college when we entered as fresh persons in 1953. There once was a goddess Pomona who possessed a mysterious smile. Like Lisa's, whose first name was Mona, she seemed serene, so lacking in guile. Her orchards of orange are gone, a victim of sprawl, of malls by the mile. The college stands, named for Pomona, still fruitful, true to her all the while. Rather than say something inspiring to give unwanted advice to those who graduate today and are the primary honorees of this occasion, I'd like to read some Eliz Elizabethan poetry about the goddess Pomona. It is from an English translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses by Arthur Golding, first published in 1567, a book that ha had a tremendous influence on William Shakespeare and was called by Ezra Pound the most beautiful book in the language in his ABC of reading. This is from the story of Pomona and Vertumnus. Pomona is a wood nymph who, as goddess of fruit trees and orchards, has no time for romance while she gardens. But Vertumnus, a Roman fruit deity, courts her by assuming the form of an old woman and telling her the dreadful story of low-born Iphis who falls in love with Lady Anaxoreti, who rebuffs him. He commits suicide, and she is turned to stone. Then, when Vertumnus resumes his manly shape, Pomona is overcome and yields to him. The message is, be soft-hearted in life. In this king's reign Pomona lived, there was not to be found among the wood nymphs any one in all the Latian ground that was so cunning for to keep an orchard as was she, and none so painful to preserve the fruit of every tree. This was her love and whole delight, and as for Venus' deeds, she had no mind at all of them, and for because she dreads enforcement by the country folk, she walled her yards about, not suffering any man at all to enter in or out. Vertumnus changes his sex to approach Pomona. And finally, in many shapes, he sought to find excess to joy the beauty, but by sight that did his heart oppress. 
Moreover, putting on his head a woman's wimple gay and staying by a staff gray hairs, he forth did lay upon his forehead and did feign a beldam for to be. By means whereof he came within her godly orchards free and wondering at the fruit said, much more skill hast thou, I see, than all the nymphs of Albula. Hail, lady mine, the flower unspotted of pure maidenhood in all the world this hour. And with that word, he kissed her a little, but his kiss was such as true old women would never have given a wiss. After telling Pomona the cautionary tale, Vertumnus reverts to male. The god that can upon him take any kind of shape he list, now having said this much in vain, omitted to persist in Beldame's shape and showed himself a lusty gentleman, appearing to her cheerfully, in like as Phoebus when, he having overcome the clouds that did withstand his might, doth blaze his brightsome beams again with fuller heat and light. He offered force, but now no force was needful in the case. For why? She being caught in love with beauty of his face, was wounded then as well as he and again to yield a pace. Thank you. It is a great honor to introduce to you today Stephen Reinhardt, Judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Judge Reinhardt is now in his fourth decade of service as a federal judge. To convey the values Judge Reinhardt brings to the bench, it's helpful to think back to a very different four decades in the history of the American judiciary, beginning with Roosevelt and the New Deal. In Judge Reinhardt's words, prior to 1936, the role of the federal courts was simple, to preserve the status quo, to support the right of employers to dictate terms of employment, to enjoin union activities, to keep the nation's wealth in the hands of the wealthy, to maintain law and order by whatever means possible. Judges came from and represented the interests of the elite. Then came the New Deal and the accompanying change in the courts, the recognition of the political rights of the individual citizen, the recognition of the collective economic rights of workers, and the recognition of government's obligation to promote the general welfare as the preamble to the Constitution commanded. The courts continued to liberalize in the post-war years, and when Stephen Reinhardt completed his law degree at Yale in 1954, Earl Warren was Chief, Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Judge Reinhardt has written, the year I graduated from law school, the Warren Court decided Brown versus Board of Education. Brown, perhaps the most important Supreme Court decision in history, introduced a new judicial era, an era in which the courts became the protectors of the rights of the poor, the disenfranchised, and the underprivileged. The court's decisions were guided by a broad humanitarian vision of the role of the judiciary and of the Constitution as a living document. By the time he was nominated for a federal judgeship by Jimmy Carter in 1980. The era of more conservative courts was on the horizon, and our New Deal Warren Court liberal was destined to fight many uphill battles on issues ranging from immigration to the administration of the death penalty to gay marriage. Sometimes he prevails, 
With humanity worthy of the war in court, for example, he framed the revocation, revocation of gay marriage in California this way. All that Proposition 8 accomplished was to take away from same-sex couples the right to be granted marriage licenses and thus legally to use the designation of marriage, which symbolizes state legitimization and societal recognition of their committed relationships. Proposition H 8 serves no purpose and has no effect other than to lessen the status and human dignity of gays and lesbians in California and to officially reclassify their relationships and families as inferior to those of opposite sex couples. The Constitution simply does not allow for laws of this sort. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he doesn't prevail. Sometimes, one might say frequently, his decisions are reversed by the Supreme Court, which he sees as increasingly disinterested in substantive justice for average citizens. He doesn't mince words about these reversals. I don't think it's our mission to anticipate the Supreme Court's deprivation of constitutional rights until they do it. <laughs> Once they do it, you have to follow it. But we get reversed because we wait until they do it. <laughs> I have the impression that he quite generally doesn't mince words, and I'm looking forward to his remarks today. Mr. President, on behalf of the Board of Trustees and the faculty of Pomona College, it is my great honor to present to you Stephen Reinhardt for the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws. Stephen Reinhardt, by the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Laws in Pomona College, honoris causa. I am most grateful to President Oxtby and whoever the other misguided individuals may be, who are responsible for awarding me this honorary degree. When I left Pomona for Yale Law School, somewhat prematurely, some 64 years ago, the last thing that would ever have occurred to me was that I'd be invited back for such an honor, or indeed invited back at all. I was not terribly popular, with the administration. <laughs> but that's another story. Uh, anyway, here I am. Pomona was a far, far different institution in the 1950s than it is today. And the change is all for the better. When I was here, there was only one minority student, Ed Moore. And he was from Liberia. And white students from the East Coast let alone Latinos or Hispanics, were about as scarce. I took the poll for student life in the 1948 presidential election, and the results were roughly 90% for Tom Dewey, the Republican candidate, 5% for Harry Truman, the Democrat who won the election, and 5% for a third-party candidate. So times change, and drastically. How lucky you are to have attended today's Pomona, <laughs> a truly cosmopolitan and world-renowned institution among the very best in this hemisphere. You cannot imagine how, how, how quickly the world changes, how different life will be as you experience the unexpected events that lie ahead. Nothing can prepare you for those changes. All you can know is that it will be exciting and that you will be a part of it. Who ever heard of a computer, the internet, or a television set in 1951, or even a drone? 
What will it be like when your children or grandchildren are ready to enroll in Pomona? Neither you nor I can even imagine it. One thing we can hope for, however, and one thing you can each help accomplish, whatever career you may choose. The month I graduated, as you have heard from law school, the Supreme Court under Earl Warren belatedly declared an end to official segregation in America. Now your generation must work and work hard to bring an end to the continuing discrimination in the justice system. <laughs> in law enforcement and in society in general. Your generation must strive, you must strive, to bring about the society we have not yet reached and for which, despite false protestations, we still have a considerable distance to go, a truly post-racial society, one that is fair to all and one in which all are truly equal. Now, in case you're looking for further advice, and I know that's why you and your families are here today, <laughs> here's a bit more. Try to enjoy life as best you can. Experience love, experience happiness, and save some time to make this a better world. In fact, doing worthwhile deeds is likely to bring you joy and happiness. In my profession, a survey of 6,200 lawyers released this week by the New York Times showed that those who were paid the least were by far the happiest. <laughs> the poll revealed that lawyers in public service or in public interest work, lawyers like public defenders enjoyed their jobs and their lives far more than those in large corporate firms, the lawyers who make the big bucks, and the public service lawyers drank less alcohol as well. <laughs> Don't think I'm advocating poverty. I'm not. But I am advocating that you do what you think you'll enjoy doing most. Don't be afraid to follow your heart, and that's my advice for your love life as well. Have fun, have compassion, have a wonderful family, and with luck, you may even find yourself back here at Pomona someday making a pompous speech <laughs> and receiving an honorary degree in front of a group of terrific young students about to go forth to lead happy and productive lives and to help make a better world. Congratulations, and I wish you all the very best. A Trappist monk, a detective, an existential writer, and a scientist. What could these four things possibly have in common? It turns out that Dr. Franz Cordova, today's Quinston speaker, considered each of them as a possible profession, the threads of which can be seen throughout her decorated academic career. At first glance, this list may seem disparate and even contradictory, but upon reflection, two things stand out. The first is that it mirrors the kind of broad vision that is a hallmark of our Pomona students, the second, incredibly enough, is that Dr. Cordova's real life path is even more remarkable than her earlier self could have imagined. Students, the moral here is if your professional bucket list includes playing the role of political activist, flamenco guitarist, environmental scientist, and cattle rancher, all at the same time, don't be deterred, but do pay attention today. Currently the director of the National Science Foundation, Dr. Cordova's decorated astrophysics career has included early stops at Caltech and the Los Alamos National Lab, NASA, where she became the youngest ever and first female chief scientist, the University of California system, where she moved from professor to vice chancellor to chancellor, and most recently to 
Purdue University, where she served as their 11th president. Based on that abbreviated resume, you might think that she was born with a telescope and a calculator in hand. But in truth, she's a poster child for the liberal arts. Despite an early interest in science, as a Stanford undergraduate, Dr. Cordova was wooed to the humanities by a love for Camus, Sartre, Joyce, and Eliot, and to the social sciences by the intrigue of conducting anthropological fieldwork near a Zapotec Indian Pueblo in Oaxaca, Mexico. She graduated cum laude with a BA in English, and based on the strength of her undergraduate work, was on the fast track to a publishing career. If we were to fast forward that story, it wouldn't take much to imagine that we might be sitting in front of a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist rather than the head of the NSF. Fortunately for astrophysics, 1969, and arguably the most important event of that year, the moon landing, were just around the corner. Dr. Cordova's scientific interests were rekindled, so she lined up research positions and graduate offers at both MIT and Caltech before committing to the latter and quickly earning her PhD. The rest, as they say, is history. The field of astrophysics is blessed with some extraordinary minds, but even more extraordinary personalities. To scale the scientific peaks that Dr. Cordova has, as well as lead institutions like NASA, Purdue, and the NSF, requires more than just a sharp intellect. It also demands a combination of broad lived experiences and perspectives rooted in her strong liberal arts training. Beyond her strictly professional accomplishments at every stage of her career, Dr. Cordova has been a role model, a mentor, and an advocate for women and minorities in science. I'm therefore grateful that her latest role at NSF will provide her the platform to drive the institutional and cultural changes that we need on a national scale. Finally, Dr. Cordova grew up in Southern California and graduated from Bishop Amat High School, just a few miles west of here in West Covina. So it's my sincere pleasure to welcome her home. Mr. President, on behalf of the Board of Trustees and the faculty of Pomona College, it is my great honor to present to you Franz Cordova for the honorary degree of Doctor of Science. Franz Cordova. By the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Science in Pomona College, honoris causa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Oxtoby and members of the Board of Trustees and Dr. Choi. I'm honored and proud to receive an honorary degree from Pomona College this morning. Graduates, congratulations, you did it. <laughs> this is one of those magical moments when everything you've been working for over the past few years comes together, including the people who helped you along the way, your parents, grandparents, teachers, and friends. So enjoy this moment. I missed my own graduation from college. I had graduated early and started working for a magazine as a guest editor. Even though I had an exciting assignment overseas writing a travel story, I missed the opportunity to be celebrating with my friends. So today, I'm enjoying your moment with you. And I appreciate so much that this is a a really incredible moment, an incredible commencement already. We've heard just inspiring talks from your student speakers, Deborah Frangpong and Cameron Joseph Cook. I am really inspired by your remarks. Thank you. I'm glad I wasn't the only lonely person in my class. <laughs> Let me start with a word about this amazing place where you've spent the last few years. As Dr. Choi said, I grew up in Southern California at a time when there were mostly orange trees here. I was doing ski beach days with my friends long before it became a Pomona tradition. <laughs> we would ski on Baldy and then go to Huntington Beach for a swim in the same day. I did many hikes in the San Gabriel Mountains and rock climbs at Takeets on the shoulder of San Jacinto Mountain by Palm Springs. I went to graduate school at Caltech. My first astronomical observations were on Mount Wilson, the site where Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe was expanding, and where Nobel Prize winner Charles Towns, inventor of the Maser and Laser, 
did research on molecules in space. And after a time elsewhere, I returned to Southern California's Inland Empire, becoming chancellor of UC Riverside. There I had the opportunity to begin the first steps for a new medical school for this great growing region, and to foster a graduation rate that was equal for students of all color. So I feel I know something of what you've experienced here. Even living in DC as I do now, I think of Southern California when I smell jasmine or see movies with tall skinny palm trees like LA Story or Clueless or any Columbo rerun. <laughs> After I left California for the second time, I became president of Purdue and I also became a regent of the Smithsonian Institution. There I had the opportunity to be around people who conserve and exhibit the nation's great collections of art, history, culture, and science, and who work to inspire people of all generations. In March of 2014, President Obama appointed me to be director of the National Science Foundation, called NSF, a job I love as it brings together everything I've ever done. It's an opportunity to support and advocate for the importance of science and engineering in this world full of great challenges. But let me tell you what I actually wanted to do when I was a young girl growing up here. I wanted to be a detective to solve mysteries. Anybody in our audience, maybe your parents who have read all the Nancy Drew books? That was me. I loved a difficult problem, putting pieces of a puzzle together. I resonate with what Einstein said, quote, I have no special talents, I'm only passionately curious. Two threads wind through my path, a desire to explore the unknown and a desire to shape something new from what I've learned. So in my remarks, let me celebrate curiosity and its outcomes and encourage your own curiosity. The agency I head, NSF, funds basic or fundamental research. This is research that more often than not is, is founded on curiosity. Such research we've seen has the power to transform the world, contributing to health, the economy and defense, and also just to inspiring people. In short, changing lives for the better. I mentioned Charles Towns, whose invention of the maser led to the laser, a device with untold practical applications. I remember well that invention because I tried to explain it in a high school science fair project. At that time, few people imagined that anything useful would come of this device. And Towns himself, in his Nobel Prize interview in 1964, said that he was motivated not by applications, but by his desire to study the structure of molecules, by his desire to understand things that were unknown. He recounts how much trouble he had getting his first ideas accepted even by fellow scientists. Yet he followed his instincts and he pursued his scientific interest, changing fields when he could chase, quote, something that was being missed. The world has changed as a result of this pursuit. The inventions that resulted from the laser include barcode scanners, laser pointers, medical applications like LASIK eye surgery, surgery for detached retinas. Lasers are used in your CDs and DVDs and in telecommunications in general to carry enormous amounts of information via fiber optics. In the early 1990s, I was a professor and department head at Penn State University. At that time, there were only about 100 websites. And the first web search tools were being launched. Back at my alma mater, Stanford University, 
a graduate student named Larry Page working with funding from one of NSF's first digital library grants started viewing the web differently as a collection of sites, not as single pages. He was joined by Sergey Brin, who had an NSF graduate student fellowship. They developed a prototype search engine that drew on decades of past literature to come up with a page ranking scheme ordered by the most often used links. And that worked. In 1998, they moved the effort out of their dorm rooms and into a friend's garage, starting the company we know as Google. And I don't have to describe how all of us draw on this search engine every day. I found my way here from LAX using Google. I regularly Google hotels and restaurants and shoes. And I even Googled information about Pomona College for this visit, learning about the mystery of 47. That's when I decided to time my speech at exactly 47 minutes. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> now, I don't expect that tomorrow you'll necessarily change the world from your garage. But I do want you to know from these examples of lasers and Google that sometimes changing the world starts with a question. Wondering why things are and how they got that way or how they can be improved. Will you be searching like Charles Towns for something that is being missed? Will you be looking at what already exists, like Larry Page, in a whole new way? You're graduates of Pomona College. You're the new wave of discoverers and inventors. And some of you will be imagineers, dreamers, and theorists. And, and some of you will be developing ideas. You're interested in art and design and engineering and putting things together in new ways. And some of you will apply the idea, perhaps starting a new product or company based on it. A story that captured two pages in the New York Times last Tuesday is that of Pomona graduate Jennifer Doudna, now a biochemist at UC Berkeley. Her research on gene editing has garnered her the status of a celebrity. Last fall, she and a female colleague won a lucrative breakthrough prize that is endowed by entrepreneurs. At the cele celebration where they received their prize were the glitterati of Hollywood and Silicon Valley, movie stars and internet moguls. Dr. Doudna grew up in Hilo, Hawaii, daughter of a literature professor. She says that a scientist lecturing on cancer at her high school inspired her. After Pomona College, she went to Harvard and pursued studies of RNA. And later, with colleagues, she figured out how a bacterial defense system could be used to edit genes, cutting and splicing as in film editing. And that was her eureka moment. I met Dr. Doudna in January at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. In an informal lunch setting, she talked about attending her son's fifth grade class and marveling at the questions and interests of young students. There's a scientist in every child, she said. I have many heroes. Not all of them are scientists. I am, after all, a college literature major. One hero is Pomona College alumna Mary Schmidt, who became a writer of one of my favorite comic strips growing up, Brenda Starr Reporter. Boy, we all wanted to be Brenda Starr Reporter. And she was also a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist. She's credited with the famous commencement speech, which is often attributed to Kurt Vonnegut, in which she enjoined students to wear sunscreen and live life without regret. Schmidt is a different kind of discoverer, one who helps us interpret life with new sensibility and reveal new insights about human nature. My hope for each of you is that you experience the euphoria when your own curiosity 
your passion to know or understand results in a eureka moment when you become the first person on the planet to see something or to do something or create something or realize something in nature or about human nature that has never been seen, never been understood before. Discovery brings disparate knowledge together in unexpected ways, and it's a singular moment when that happens. A handful of singular moments changed my life. The night I launched a rocket payload when I was a student from White Sands, New Mexico, to detect collapsed stars. Would the rocket actually go up? Was I safe, this close to the launching pad? Would we see anything new? And the day I saw the telltale signal in my satellite data of the X-ray pulsations of an accreting star, no way, that's my thesis there, finally. And then there's the day I nervously said, I do, with my spouse. Whoa, what am I doing here? It's going to be a great adventure. Wonder, curiosity, discovery, and commitment. I wish each of you a lifetime of all of these and much happiness besides. I close with this observation, graduates. 47% of you will celebrate tonight. 47% of you started celebrating last night. <laughs> and that leaves, let's see, 6% um, who aren't sure when to start celebrating. So may I suggest now, now would be a great time to celebrate. Congratulations. <laughs>
Emma Alexandra Teddy. Catherine Ann Valentine. Sophia Catherine McPherson Soprani. Oh. Samuel Jacob Kaplan. Anthony Gomez. Samuel Stevenson Abrams. Kimberly Yonko, Africa. Samuel Jamal Akhtar. Samuel Hofmeister Alberg. Chris Linnea Alving Trin. Priya Magdalene Armitage. Claire Bradford Anderson. Courtney Marie Anderson. Sabrina Antoinette Anderson. Jenna Naomi Archer. Soshi Maitel Arashiga. Nathaniel Sung Spence Ash. Asia Ray Katsura Ayabe. Jet George Silas Bachman. Rebecca Louise Bayman. Jordan Samuel Bank. Mariah Valerie Barber. Haley Elizabeth Barrows. Catherine Marie Barton. Alexander James Bow. Kimi Elizabeth Miyakawa Beck. Hugh George Berryman. Tessa Mariah Bertazzi. Anisha Bott. Graham Lucas Bishop. Benjamin Alexander Blyberg. Leah Rose Bleichner. Sarah Rose Blumenthal. Naomi Adana Bosch. Nicholas Alex Bugopoulos. Nigel Stanton Brady. Julian Breistroff. Brian Christopher Brown. Claire Halsey Brown. Woo! 
Hannah Isabella Brown. Nicholas Christopher Brown. Rachel Pesavento Brownell. Jacob Robert Brummel. Shabrina Sarai Bruno. Reina Salome Buenconsejo. Shannon Michelle Burns. Heather Roisin Byrne. Kevin James Byrne. Samantha B. Cahill. Ramoncito Lagman Caleon. Erica Konishi Carlson. Andrea Carmona. Jordan Thomas Castillo. Eleanor Kathleen Swent Cawthon. Serena Michelle Check. Jennifer Zhang Chai. Melissa Elizabeth Chambers. Jonathan Chan. Jedrick Einer Chow. Bernice Chen. Eileen Chen. Marissa Abigail Cherry. Anita Kaime Chong. Daniel Jayun Choi. Berenger Christie. Caleb Everett Chu. Kevin Michael Chung. Rasko Chiric. Shana Louise Citronbaum. Benjamin Lloyd Cloer. Amanda Suzanne Koba. Marissa Elizabeth Cohen. Michael Alexander Cohen. Alexander Edward Cole. Lauren Vaughn Collins. Trey Austin Connett. David Logan Connor. Maria de Los Angeles Contreras. William Gerald Curatolo.
Kimberly Louise Cyrus. <laughs> Natalie Elizabeth De Fotis. <laughs> Richard Lee Dama. <laughs> Emily Christine Darby. Danielle Alexandria Davis. Matthew Paul Delangis. William Joseph DeRose. Nicole Del Valle. Joan Marie Del Vecchio. Aaron Rose Delaria. Natalie Garner Dennis. Karen Johanna Denton. Reese Arnold Denzel. Andrea Estefania Diaz. Luis Francisco Diaz. Madison Mary Dipman. Ryan Adam Dodson. <laughs> Dylan Jing Dong. <laughs> Kiara Lisa Dorigo. <laughs> Catherine Elizabeth Lou Dugan. Diana Abdurrahman Duri. <laughs> Kulsum Tufel Ibrahim. <laughs> Joshua Taylor Edgecombe. <laughs> Alexandra Teeple Elder. Nicholas Ming Hao Eng. Clara Hillary Engel. Alicia Sarah Epstein. Xiaofan Fong. Corey Nathaniel Fain. Jonathan Stewart Feingold. Jasmine Joy Ferguson. Pascal Sabino Fernandez. Jacob Daniel Fixel. Atsiri Elizabeth Fonseca. <laughs> Jefferson Avery Fox. <laughs> Alexandra Jupner Frappier. <laughs> Kenton Paul Freemuth. Brian Daniel Friel. <laughs> Catherine Frost. <laughs> Anne Alexis Fulton. <laughs> Trinity Roxanne Furman.
Nidhi Gandhi. <laughs> Hong Deng Gao. Summa cum laude. Javier Garcia. Yesenia Fabiola Garcia. Eleanor Tidwell Gardner. Andres Garduño. Christopher David Garnatz. Alexander G. Genty Waksberg. Benjamin James Girodius. Ted Ku. Emily Rose Rothschild Glass. William Morris Goldberg. Robert Trevor Goldman. Christian Joseph Gomez. Dylan Richard Harris Goodman. Reed Matthew Goodman. Brenna Mary Gilligan Gormley. Sheridan Lloyd Grant. Jordan Elizabeth Green. Jiang Yu Gu. Uriel Alexander Guadarrama. <laughs> Kevin Guan. <laughs> Yu Chao Guo. <laughs> Nissa Sage Gustafson. Victoria Bozing Gorfi. <laughs> Wesley Malloy Haas. <laughs> Clayton Thomas Hardman. <laughs> Jason Michael Harris. <laughs> Lila Fairfax Hawkinson. Spencer Curtis Heim. Marie Elise Helmy. Jessica Hernandez. Sishen Inoue Hernandez Martinez. Karen Alejandra Herrera. Daniel James Hirsch. Megan Marie Holman. Jack Lee Horstman. Connor Edward Hudson. <laughs> Peter John Ianelli. <laughs> Alonso Iniguez Juarez. <laughs> Ray
Rachel Lee Jackson. Katrina, Katrina Lizette Jacobs. Zoe Omolara Jameson. David Carl Janowski. Manya Lynn Janowitz. Audrey Perry Jaquis. Nathan Tollett Jefferson. Hyo Min John. Yi Ting Ji. Jerry Pung Jong. Sarah Llewellyn Yunt. Jared Simon Kalo. Mary Lyon Kamitaki. Alexandra Kurapetrov. Unique. Timothy Kazushi K. Alexander David Kellogg. Tierra Shanti Marie Kemp. Lauren Haley Kirschberg. Benjamin Martin Kirsten. Rachel Sakamaki Kieser. Michael UJ Kim. Robert George Knickerbocker. Danica Lynn Critter. Marissa Taylor Kura. Helen Victoria Lamb. Travis Michael Larson. Bryn Marie Lawner. Kaya Jordan Legrand. Brighton Lee. Dong Yong Lee. Wu Hyung Lee. Louis Alfonso Lemus Mogrovejo. J. Ming Li Summa Cum Laude. Benjamin Atticus Lieber. Abigail Emily Lyles. Rebecca Joy Lim. Jessica Leong Jen Lu. Carlin Elizabeth Long. Bogdan Vladov Lukanov. <laughs> Hanny Marie Love. Hannah Marie Love.
Kevin Liu. Shannon Nicole Lubitich. Haley Nicole Luce. Alexander Chiwei Ma. Amalia Devereaux Madrid. Arash Nick Mabubi. Sumiko Isabel Marisani. Allison Leigh Marks. Jordy Owen Mariner. Yeah, Jordy. Gervais Allen Joseph Marsh. Jaslyn Giselle Martinez. Brian Masato Matsumoto. Kyrie Johnson Mazzolini. Kyle St Steer McCormick. Okay. Kyle Steer McAndrew. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so now we're there. Okay. Kristen Elaine McCormick, summa cum laude. Nicole Aaron McDuffie. Hannah Clift McGinnis. Jesse Jacob Medina. Jorge Manuel Mejia Vasquez. Emmanuel de Jesus Mendez. Jewel Mensa. Allison Rose Mercer Smith. <laughs> Stephanie Noel Mickham. <laughs> Antonella Andonia Mijo. <laughs> Logan Christopher Miller. Luke James Miller. <laughs> William Ellis Mills. <laughs> Carla Itzel Molina. <laughs> Mauricio Arnoldo Molina. Ricardo Morales. <laughs> Kenny W. Moran. Vince Kyle Morgan. Dixie Maria Morrison. Tafadzwa Fungai Mtizi. <laughs> Shri Charitha Mulaguru. <laughs> Jenny Neftali Munez. 
Miriel U. Munyamana. Alana Catherine Olson Murphy. Daniel Edward Meinick. Larissa Noel Nakatsu. Bishoy Hani Nasri. Julie Christine Neckersommer. Sean T. Defa Neff Barrow. Charlie Peterlin Nybel. Kelly Lan Nguyen. Joyce Maria Nemex. Susan Jessica Nussbaum. Matthew Michael O'Connor. Sebastian Ojeda. Edwina Andrea Omonte Yawata. Fernando Velasquez Ortega. Teresa Rose Osborne. Ryan Kin Ota. Allison Camille Pagan. Scott Cameron Ponick. Eric Joseph Passwork. Aaron Rahul Patel. Parth Dinesh Patel. Jacob Andrew Patton. Patrick Pellegrini O'Day. Claire Jennifer Pershing. Brian Swong Fawn. Liana Piedra. Dylan Seth Pollock. Galen Marie Portlance. Mahalia Prater Fahey. George Wilson Price. Chowin Xu. Nicole Marie Quilliam. <laughs> Kenneth Colin Rabin. Amy Margaret Ragsdale. Avery Luke Raimondo. Hunter Charles Reardon. James Robert Reinke. Joseph Leonard Reynolds. <laughs> Timot 
Timothy James Reynolds. Fiona Daphne Ferris Riley. Julian Todd Rippey. Carolyn Marie Robbins. Hannah Catherine Robertson. King Edquis Charman Robinson. <laughs> William Lincoln Robinson. Nicole James Ross. Emma Angela Rottenborn. Shakela Brene Rouse. Gustavo Ruiz. Sydney Colleen Roop. Andrew Chester Russell. Cristina Saldana. Adi Doredi Salinas Ferreira. Olufemi Temidayo Saliu. Christina Elaine Salvador. Alex Wilson Samuels. Bhavan Reshi Hirsch Sangani. Alexa Jordan Sarusi. Mariah Janice Scales. Guy Kane Scherzer. Jeremy Markowitz Schaefer. Molly Amanda Shalman. Michael Joseph Shapiro. Nathan Andrew Shakita. Niati Shinoy. Nola Ying Shi. Oliver Arrow Shirley. Susanna Claire Shoemaker Summa Cum Laude. Julianne Catherine Shreve. Stasia Galia Hanna Sichko. Laura Francis Scow. Matthew John Sloan. Trevor Smith. Catherine Elizabeth Snell. Tina Ann Solvik. Michael Adam Somek. Dakota Marie Spear. Woo! 
Thalia Sokurgis Spinrad. <laughs> Noah James Stanton. <laughs> Jennifer Marie Stewart. <laughs> Samantha Paulette Stewart. Cole Robert Story. Let's go, Cole! <laughs> Pryor McKeever Stroud. <laughs> Yu Itrium Swa, summa cum laude. Connor Jameson Sutton. <laughs> Donald Brett Swan. <laughs> Warren Joseph Sefchek. <laughs> Lucas John Tamanen. Amelia Plout, Toronto. <laughs> Catherine Carlotta Taylor. <laughs> Angelica Cecilia Tejas. <laughs> Isa? Isa Renee Terrell. Alistair Scott Thompson. Daniel Wheeler Thompson. Megan Miyoko Tokunaga. Jacqueline B. Tran. Anna Christina Turner. <laughs> Alexandria Marie Valdrigi. <laughs> Hugo Sitzar Valencia. <laughs> Gerardo Florencia Vargas. Naomi Rommel Vather. <laughs> Sydney Alfred Vega. John Thomas Verticchio. Watina Sabinova Vidolova. Sally Seaver Waleka. <laughs> Megan Colette Walner, summa cum laude, Rena Gurley Archibald High Scholarship Prize. <laughs> Christopher Brafford Walters. Abigail Edith Wong. <laughs> Kevin Y. Wang. <laughs> Emily Ann Wasserman. <laughs> Hannah Catherine Wayment Steele. Kevin Yoon Wei. Sarah Catherine Westcott. Maria Bailey Wyrock.
Kyle Zachary Whalen. Jesse Sperling White. Molly Lyndon Wilkerson. Jacob Aaron Wilson. Tyler Ayana Womack. Jonathan Robert Wong. Yen Lee Wong. Kira Ann Woods. Shang <laughs> Shang. Robin Shu. Samuel Ga Ging Young. Carolyn Selwa Zaya. <laughs> Chian Ro Zhang, summa cum laude. <laughs> Yifan Yu. Cameron Joseph Cook. Deborah Aquia Frempong. The class of 2015. Over the last year, two words have been much on my mind, daring and safe. All over campus, you, sh you see signs that say, Campaign Pomona, Daring Minds. This is indeed the theme of our campaign, which is aimed at raising resources for our many strategic goals, and which will conclude seven months from now at the end of December. The phrase speaks to the value of taking risks of encouraging students and faculty to move out of their comfort zones, to dare to think big rather than settle for something easy. It connects to creativity and innovation, core values for Pomona College and for all of liberal arts education. It recalls the spirit of adventure present in the very air of California, whether in the challenge of climbing the highest mountain in the lower 48, the innovation present in countless Silicon Valley startups, or the inspiration found in Los Angeles, the creative capital of the world. Pomona College lives to foster this daring spirit, as exemplified by the plans that many of you in the class of 2015 have after graduation. At the same time, the word safe has entered our public vocabulary in ways that differ from the past. I'm speaking here of the safe spaces that we try to create to foster community and communication. On campuses across the country, there has been discussion of trigger warnings, recognizing the ways in which pain from the past can bring up difficult memories for some when encountering challenging or specific kinds of subjects inside and outside the classroom. 
Pomona College strives to create safe spaces in the best sense of that word, places where with community support and open dialogue, we can face difference and talk about even the most difficult issues that are out there in the world around us. In common language, the words daring and safe are sometimes imagined to be opposites. Playing it safe suggests avoiding risks, sticking with what is known, settling for something tried and true, rather than taking chances and allowing ourselves the possibility of failing. And of course, either of these directions can be taken too far. Daring can turn into reckless, in which we put ourselves and others at serious risk by taking chances without thinking of the consequences. Safe can turn into comfortable, where we are satisfied with the status quo, with our own privilege, and never challenge ourselves by looking at the perspective of others. Or it can imply avoidance of difficult subjects and missing out on the growth that can result from confronting issues that challenge us. But I believe that the best of daring and safe can be combined, and that this is the heart of what we strive for at Pomona College. Let me develop a metaphor to explain what I mean. For 19 days in December and January, the public was captivated by the efforts of two climbers to complete the first free climb of the Dawn Wall of El Capitan in Yosemite National Park. On January 14, Tommy Caldwell and Kevin Jorgensen achieved their dream and reached the top. My first image when I heard the term free climb was to picture two young men with packs and without any equipment at all just making their way up a wall, which of course would have been crazy. But then I learned that this expedition was planned for five years and fully supported by an entire team who lowered supplies to the climbers, providing the logistics that helped them to succeed. Most important, each climber was attached to safety ropes so that in the event of a fall, they would be caught and not drop to the valley below. Jorgensen took seven days to complete just one particularly difficult section of the climb, falling 11 times, being caught by his safety ropes, and trying again. On his 11th try, he succeeded in crossing to the next safe site and was able to continue to the top. What a daring effort by the two climbers. Rather than be content to do easy climbs with likely success, the only kind I would ever try, they took on an incredible challenge. And before they succeeded, they failed many times with each fall, picking themselves up and trying something a little different the next time. This was not a reckless effort, though, but one in which considerations of safety were paramount. The climbers did everything they could to support one another and to reduce the risk of death and physical harm through their planning and their safety measures. Is there a lesson for us at Pomona College in this feat? I like to think of our education at its very best as a system in which students are encouraged to challenge themselves in new and difficult areas, but with a safety system in place to support them in those efforts. Part of that education is learning to fail, to make mistakes repeatedly, but then to learn from them, try again, and eventually succeed. Like the Yosemite climbers looking back on their 19-day climb, as you reflect on your four years here on campus, think about chances you took and ways in which you failed and what you learned from those failures. You can all be proud of where you stand right now. But of course, a world awaits you after graduation. It is not a world that is separate from your life on campus, since the issues of the world have been very much present for you in your time here. The recent earthquake in Nepal took place halfway around the world, but two students from Pomona and others from the Claremont Colleges were there at the time and thankfully have returned safe. Sexual violence is sadly not just something that takes place in dangerous locations that we have been warned to avoid, but it can intrude and damage lives on the most idyllic of campuses. Ferguson, Missouri and Baltimore, Maryland are not just places on the map, but are the sites of events that have a direct bearing on the lives of members of this college community and have inspired the powerful national message that black lives matter. At Pomona College, we strive to create a space in which members of the community can take chances and aim high while being supported and kept safe. Yes, we sometimes fall short of this goal, and at Pomona, we do not hesitate to say that we can and must do better. And so, too, I ask of you, members of the class of 2015, that as you graduate and move out into the world, I hope that you will set high goals 
and help to build communities that will support others in reaching their own goals. Don't be comfortable, but stay safe. Don't be reckless, but be daring. Congratulations to the class of 2015.